Over the next reporting period, the Commission will continue to finalize the draft SPL amendment bill and regulations, facilitate any requests for viewing the register of interest, monitor and handling matters relating to the submission of declarations by persons in public life, consider feedback on the new register of interest online portal, address any complaints received, participate in any education or public relation opportunities, as well as in local and regional cooperation efforts where possible, accept and investigate any alleged or suspected breaches of standards, standards under this law in accordance with section 18 and 19 of the SPL and continue to participate in any educational or public relation opportunities as well as in local and regional cooperation efforts where possible. I encourage members of the House to and the public to familiarize themselves with the contents of the report, which is available online at the Commission's website, www.standardsinpubliclifecommission.ky. I thank you, Madam Speaker. The 22nd report of the Commission for the Standards in Public Life for the period of 1st of August 2021 to the 31st of January 2022 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Deputy Governor. The Honorable Deputy Governor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the 22nd report of the Commission of Standards in Public Life, which covers the period 1st of August 2021 to the 31st of January 2022. Does the Honourable Member wish to speak? Yes, Madam Speaker, briefly. So ordered. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I offer a brief overview of the 22nd report of the Commission's in Standard, Standards in Public Life, which relate to the period 1st of August 2021 to the 31st of January 2022. This is the first report under the chairmanship of Dr. Sonia Bush. This report covers the progress made and the issues arising from the work completed by the Commission during the first half of their first year in office. During the reporting period, the members discussed proposed amendments to the SPL Act and regulations, discussed proposed changes to the Commission's Code of Conduct, and spent time considering and handling matters relating to the submission of declarations by, by persons in public life. Over the next reporting period, the Commission will continue to finalize the draft SPL amendment bill and regulations, facilitate any requests for viewing the register of interest, monitor and handle matters relating to the submission of declarations by per persons in public life, consider feedback on the register of interest online portal, address any complaints received, submit the development of a parliamentary code of conduct, and participate in education or public relation opportunities as well as in local and regional cooperation efforts where possible. I encourage members of the House and the public to familiarize themselves with the contents of the report, which is available online on the Commission's website at www.standardsinpubliclifecommission.ky. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Human Rights Commission, Cayman Islands, Annual Report 2021, Report and Period, 1st of January 2021 to 31st of December 2021, to be laid on the table by the Honorable Deputy Governor. The Honorable Deputy Governor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the Human Rights Commission Annual Report 2021, Reporting Period, 1st of January 2021 to the 31st of December 2021. Does the Honorable Member wish to speak? Yes, Madam Speaker, briefly. The reporting period, the Commission advocated for the implementation of a parliamentary code of conduct and issued official statements amidst the global pandemic in relation to quarantine voters and migrant complaints. The Commission enhanced its public engagement with active participation in community events and facilitated an informative training session for the Cayman Islands Independent Monitoring Board. Lastly, the Commission received assessed and addressed queries and complaints in relation to human rights matters. The Commission has continued its work to promote, protect and preserve the integration of human rights values into everyday life by continuing to monitor human rights in policy, practice and legislation. 
develop innovative strategies to build awareness through education, events, and presentations, investigating alleged breaches or infringements of human rights by public officials, and engaging with civil society and the, and the media. I encourage members of the House and, to the, and the public to familiarize themselves with the content of the report, which is available at www.humanrightscommission.ky. I'd like to take this opportunity to formally thank the ongoing member, Ms. Dorothy Scott, for her service and valuable contribution to the Commission, and I'm grateful for her dedication and commitment to improving our beloved islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. CIAA Annual Report 2017 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Tourism and Transport. The Honorable Minister of Tourism and Transport. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to lay on the Honorable Floor this House um, the Cayman Islands Airport Authority Annual Report for 2017. Does the Honorable Minister wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker, very briefly. In accordance with Section 52, 8, and 9 of the Public Management and Finance Act 2020 revision, I place before this Honorable House the audited financial statements of the Cayman Islands Airports Authority for the fiscal year ended the 31st of December 2017. Madam Speaker, the audited financial statements show revenue of 50.2 million for the year ended the 31st of December 2017. This represents a 19.2 million, 62.3% uh, change in revenue over the 30th of June 2016. The improved revenue intake, Madam Speaker, was driven by improved passenger throughput in the period under review, in addition to the change in the financial reporting period. The authority's financial year ended was changed from the 30th of June to the 31st of December as a result of an amendment to the Public Management and Finance Law, now known as Act in 2017. Accordingly, the financial statements have been prepared for the 18-month period ended the 31st of December 2017, including the transition period. The 1st of July 2016 to the 31st of December 2016. The 12-month period ended June 30th, 2016 is therefore not comparable to the December 31st, 2017 numbers. Total expenditure for the 18-month period ended the 31st of December, 2017 was 41.1 million and 18.6 million, an 18.6 million increase over the 22.5 million spent for the year ended on the 31st of June 2016, which was a 12-month period. As at the 31st of December 2017, the Cayman Islands Airports Authority had, a total, had, had total reported assets of 192.4 million, moving from 175.1 million as of the 30, 30th of June 2016. This growth is, is asset value. This growth in asset value was primarily driven by the increase in property, plant, and equipment as a result of the Owen Roberts International Airport Redevelopment Project. Madam Speaker, these financial statements have been audited by the Auditor, Auditor General's Office in accordance with Section 29A of the Public Management and Finance Law 2020 revision. An unqualified opinion has been issued on these financial statements. Happy to say, Madam Speaker. The Auditor General states that the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position and financial performance and cash flows of the Cayman Islands Airports Authority as of the 31st of December 2017 in accordance with the international financial reporting standards. Madam Speaker, I wish to advise the Honorable House that the financial report of the Cayman Islands Airports Authority were delayed due to a domino effect of delays and ensuring investigations of the 2014, along with various other personal changes with the Cayman Islands Airports Authority's financial department and the scheduling of the OAG office. I am pleased to advise that this honorable house, uh, pleased to advise this honorable house that the Auditor General's office is nearing completion of the 2018 audit and the 2019 audit. 
um, has been commenced. Madam Speaker, in closing, I'd like to thank the board and the management of the Cayman Islands Airports Authority for their efforts in producing, in producing these audited financials and the Office of the Auditor General for auditing them. I now invite all members of this Honorable House and the public to review the report in detail. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Annual Report 2020, Cayman Islands Tourism Attraction Board, to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Tourism and Transport. The Honorable Minister of Tourism and Transport. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to lay before this Honorable House of Cayman Islands Tourism Attraction Board Annual Report 2020. Does the Honorable Minister wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker, just briefly. In accordance with Section 52.5 of the Public Management and Finance Law 2020 Revision, I'm pleased today to place before this Honorable House the audited financial statements of the Cayman Islands Tourism Attraction Board for the fiscal year, fiscal year of 2020. Madam Speaker, the Cayman Islands Attr Tourism Attraction Board is a statutory authority established under the Tourism Attraction Board Law in 1996, Law 17 of 1996, on the 25th of November, 1996. The primary function of the Tourism Attraction Board is the general and financial management of the government-owned tourism attraction in accordance, tourism attractions in accordance with the aforementioned law and the cabinet derivatives. Those are Pedro St. James, the Queen's Elizabeth Botanic Park, the sec Queen Elizabeth II Botanic Park, the Hell Geological Site, the Cayman Islands Craft Market, the operations of the authority are regulated by government of the Cayman Islands. Madam Speaker, the 2020 audited financial statements show that the total income for the year ended the 31st of December 2020 was $2,372,389, while total expenditures were $2,514,528. This resulted in a net deficit of $142,139. The authority had current assets of $1,755,083 and a non-current assets of $5,203,387. Total assets equaled to $6,969,000. $470 at the 31st of December 2020. The current liabilities were $329,815 and there were no non-current liabilities. Total liabilities therefore, Madam Speaker, equal to $329,815. $329,815. Total equity being contributed, um, contributed capital and retained earnings equal to $6,639,655. Total liabilities and equity amounts to $6,969,470. Madam Speaker, the audited financial statements of the Tourism Attraction Board includes the Auditor General's opinion. The entity received an unqualified opinion for the year ended 2020. The Auditor General found that the financial statements of the authority present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the Tourism Attraction Board and its entities as of the 31st of December 2020 and its financial performance and its statements of cash flows for the year ended in accordance with the international public sector accounting standards. Madam Speaker, in closing, I would like to thank the board and the management of the Cayman Islands Tourism Attraction Board for their efforts in producing these audited financial statements and the Office of the Auditor General for, their auditing, for the auditing of them. I invite all members of this Honorable House and the public to review the reports in detail for further information. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Mental Health Commission Annual Report 2021 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Madam Speaker, I um, rise to place to lay on the table of this Honorable House the Mental Health Commission Annual Report 2021. Does the Honorable Minister wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Section 8 of the Mental Health Commission Law 2013, I am pleased today to table in this Honorable House the Annual Report for the Mental Health Commission for the calendar year 2021. Madam Speaker, the Mental Health Commission was established back in January of 2014 under the Mental Health Commission Law 2013. Its members consist are Dr. Mark Lockhart, who is the chair, Klein Glidden, Jr., Deputy Chair, Honorable Alex Henderson, QC, Deputy Chair, Sutton Burke, Member, Nurse Dimpa Carton, Member, Fiona McDougall, Member, Cheryl Miles, Member, Jackie Neal, Member, Dr. Inoka Richens, Member, Janet Flynn, Secretary, Ministries Liaison. Now, the members of the Mental Health Commission are stakeholders from various sectors representing legal health care practitioners with training in mental health and advocates, also laypersons. Madam Speaker, the function of the Mental Health Commissions are divided into three sections. Quasi-judicial to hear and determine appeals under various sections of the law and conduct reviews where a patient has detained, has been detained and released under an emergency detention order three or more times in 30 days. Recommendations to the Health Practice, pa Health Practice Commission and councils. Now this includes submitting an annual report to the minister with responsibility of health, reviewing and advising on scopes of practice and codes of ethics for practitioners providing policy advice, to the relevant registering councils and advising the Health Practice Commission regarding mental health facilities, medical research, and clinical trials in mental health. Other general functions, Madam Speaker, includes obtaining and compiling statistics on mental health, oversee and delivery mental health training for constables, prison officers, and other persons expected to deal with mental health patients in the performance of their functions, approve of list of overseas mental health facilities, research and establish protocols and guidelines for mental health advocacy and approve persons to act as advocates, establish and maintain a program which provides information to the general public concerning mental health illness and coordinating, um, coordinating disorders and related conditions, review every six months the progress of remand prisoners deemed unfit to plea and submit, submit it to the chief officer, judicial administration, and to give policy advice to the minister responsible for health on any aspect of the local mental health system. Madam Speaker, I will now like to speak on the contents of this specific report. Madam Speaker, on a procedural matter, please. May I get an explanation as who the stranger in the chamber is? Because under conventions, a camera should not be arbitrarily taking pictures of members. Certainly, I'm not in agreement with it. I, is he a member of GIS? Thank you. Um, I do apologize. I failed to make an announcement earlier this morning to uh, advise members that I have granted permission to the gentleman who is employed by GIS just for today and tomorrow to take some photographs on behalf of the government as they are rolling out a new communications plan um, to enhance the engagement with the public in relation to our parliament. Madam Speaker, with the greatest respect, I take your apology and I accept your explanation. But one ought to remember that this is the people's house. There's a government and an opposition and a camera person is not allowed to arbitrarily have their camera roaming around the place. Otherwise, we'll end up with what we had on two occasions before, an uh, unsanctimonious photo of a member of parliament while it's not speaking in the picture circulating on social media. That's the reason the rules are there.
I thank the Honorable um, Minister. If it is the wish of the Parliament for me to ask the photographer to leave, I can do so. I, I'll be advised by all members on their wishes. Can I ask, what is the purpose of the, the photos? Thank you, um, Honorable Member for West Bay West. The purpose of the photos are being used for government informational services. They are rolling out a communication plan, um, particularly in relation to the proceedings of Parliament. And I think today was the first commencement. I do apologize. I failed to announce it earlier. Um, however, if members wish for me to ask the photographer to leave and we can resume this later, I'll be guided. Honorable Premier. Madam Speaker, um, I was generally aware of the proposal uh, for GIS um, to be involved with a different approach in terms of communication of the activities of Parliament for the benefit of the people of the country. Um, obviously, I wasn't aware of all the specific details of it, but um, clearly you have given um, permission for, for the photographer to be here. Um, I equally do not wish to stand in the way of, of um, members generally if there's a, if there's a, a level of discomfort. Uh, but I would, I would ask that, you know, we give the opportunity uh, to this, this new communications plan for the benefit of both the opposition as well as the government um, to work. And of course, you can give, us, you can give the guidelines that you, that you think fit and perhaps members might have the opportunity to, to indicate to you what sort of guidelines you want. I understand the concerns about the potential for someone to be taking a picture of activities on someone's desk or a note that's written or something like that. But I think the attempt is, is laudable in the sense that it is an attempt to communicate more fully to the people of the country for the betterment of the people of the country exactly what the activities of, of Parliament are. And so they're fully aware and better informed. I think we all would welcome the opportunity for that to happen because there's often a complaint that there's not enough communication from the members of the public. But of course we do have concerns and I'm not sh quite sure at this point how to resolve that other than um, perhaps asking more senior members with, with um, longer, level, longer service to express their views. Honourable Minister of Tourism and Transport. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just rise to add a little bit of input to the current matter at hand, not from the well-experienced perspective, because this is only my second term, but from a media perspective. Uh, you, as the Honourable Speaker, have outlined that this is a government agency, a contracted worker on their behalf. Therefore, the government agency will be responsible for the content of those pictures as well as to the distribution of which pictures would be the most appropriate. I think we should have enough confidence within our own government information services that those files will be kept in, and, in a protective manner and whatever ones are distributed will be distributed in a very um, um, digested way. Um, Madam Speaker, I do agree that we should be doing better with our media exposure so people can see that we are working hard in this honorable house and I as member of, and of this government do not um, uh, would want to deny the gentleman from as a Caymanian for getting this job opportunity for these two days he's a, uh, a, a, a business owner of his own contracted by GIS I laud them for using Caymanians to do this job um, and I would hate to know that we based on our own fears of something potentially negative happening, um, um, take away that opportunity from the gentleman. I, I, again, I say, once this is contracted by the Cayman Islands 
government information services. We should feel comforted that those pictures that are taken are within the government's remit, and therefore any picture of a person, hypothetically speaking, getting caught in a yawn or, or rubbing their eye or something like that wouldn't get out on social media. So I think it, it should, be, should be allowed. That's my humble input, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg your indulgence. For some reason, it seems that certain persons have to elucidate on matters whether or not they have the experience or the intellectual capacity. That is not the case this morning. I rise purely on a procedural matter. Has nothing to do whether he's Caymanian, has absolutely nothing to do whether he's working with GIS. In fact, had he had on the required badge that is required by the rules there, the question would not have to been asked. He would have been properly briefed that when you're in Parliament, despite the fact that some people don't seem to recognize the importance and significance of a parliamentary democracy, you have to wear the badge, and he should have been briefed that you only take pictures of a member when he or she is standing on the feet. This is not a Hollywood Hall. This is not a PR stunt. It's the seat of democracy and their rules and conventions for different reasons. I have absolutely no lack of confidence in GIS and their capability to take photographs and do it the right way. But this is a house of parliament, and as much as we would like to think so, it's not a house of government. There's a government and there's an opposition, and it has to be seen. Perception becomes actuality. And for the past several months, what has obtained in this house is a erosion greater than what obtains at West Bay Beach when it comes to parliamentary sanctity and democracy. And I wish I did not have to stand to say it, but somebody has to say it. I thank the member for her sound words. Um, we all can appreciate her experience here. What I will do, I've already granted the member from GIS permission to take photographs, but I will ask for the parliamentary page to just have a word with him um, to run back over the rules which were provided. Perhaps he did not get a copy of them and um, also to provide him with a badge, although it's a bit after the fact, but just so that we can have um, going forward. And I thank the member for her concerns. Is, does anyone else wish to speak on this matter? Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. Oh, go ahead. I give way. Honorable member Thank you, from Madam Speaker. I, I, just, I just want to, to say a few things which I think um, may have been forgotten. As the Honorable Minister who spoke, uh, Minister for Education who spoke, said, Parliament is not an agency of the Cayman Islands government. We battle, some of us in here, the member from, from West Bay, West, the minister who spoke herself, some of us, other members, for years to give this parliament by legislation the autonomy which the principles of Westminster government properly require. This parliament is now run by a parliamentary management commission. Decisions which involve matters such as this are decisions which properly ought to be taken by the parliament management commission, which is made up of members of both sides of the house. The member for education is absolutely right. What I have seen happening over, the last, over this term is a situation where the government is making decisions which are properly the province of the Parliamentary Management Commission. So I don't want to get into to this. I had no idea what was transpiring. But I just want us all to remember that we have a duty, not just to represent our people on, on matters re related to their constituents, our constituencies and, and broader policies. But we have an overriding responsibility to continue the development and preservation of this sacred concept called 
parliamentary democracy. For we look around the world and we see how that is being eroded in other places, places like the United States where people would, would have thought it, it's not possible for democracy itself to be at stake. So I think, Madam Speaker, you are brand new at this. I, I, I certainly lay no, no blame at your feet. But I just want us all to remember that when it comes to matters involving the House at that sort of level, it is the Parliamentary Management Commission that should be involved and should take those sort of decisions. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. Does the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition still wish to speak? No, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Before we move on, I just want to remind the photographer if you could just please refrain from taking photographs of the members only unless they are standing. And then we will have a conversation when we break for lunch. Minister for Health and Wellness, you may continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I continue. Long-term mental, long-term residential mental health facility. <laughs> Should I go? <laughs> we probably need that. <laughs> um, Madam Speaker, as you are aware, in July 2017, the Ministry of Health on behalf of the Cayman Islands government signed a contract with Montgomery CSAM Architects Inc., a Toronto-based company to conduct a, the design and construction cost consultancy services for the building of a long-term residential mental health facility. M Madam Speaker, on October 8, 2019, the Cayman Islands government broke ground on the construction of the long-term residential mental health facility. The completion of the project has been inevitably delayed due to external factors, mainly the COVID-19 pandemic, most recently supply chain issues, and even inclement weather. And an updated report will be provided to this honorable house in due time. Let's go into training as contained in this report. Madam Speaker, training on the mental health legislation and increasing mental health awareness amongst our, our, our community continue to be a focus of the Commission. Last year, the Mental Health Commission conducted two training sessions. The first to staff of the custody suites of RCIPS, that's the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service, and the second to the new recruits of, of His Majesty's Cayman Islands Prison Service. Madam Speaker, the training conducted by the Commission provides a platform for feedback and dialogue on how to address stigma, public education, de-escalation, and ident identifying some of the challenges and possible solutions surrounding mental health. Madam Speaker, it is a requirement under the Mental Health Act 2022 revision for all detention forms to be sent to the Secretary of the Mental Health Commission for storage and filing. Madam Speaker, for the year 2021, there were 62 patients admitted for various types and degrees of mental illness. The number of detention forms received was 103, similar to the number of forms received the previous year. 
In 2021, there was a significant increase in the use of the request for review form, and this may be uh, constructed, um, constituted as the increased awareness around the use of the form for families, friends, and the wider community. As they suspect a person is in need of mental health services and needs assistance. The request for review form may be completed by a nearest relative of the patient who is of the opinion that a patient is suffering from mental illness, mental impairment, or may ha harm him himself. Once the form is completed and taken to the medical officer and the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service officer is, de is deployed to assist with taking the patient into protective custody. If they require hospitalization, an emergency detention order lasting up to 72 hours is issued. Now, the use of the assisted outpatient treatment order detention form continues to be very relevant in the treatment of patient and allows a treatment psychiatrist to provide treatment with or without the patient's consent. There are no appeals received by the commission for the year 2021. I'll explain a little bit on the data collection form. Madam Speaker, as required under the Mental Health Commission law, one of the functions of the commission is to obtain and compile statistics on mental illness in order to report on the needs of the island's mental health system. Madam Speaker, for the year 2021, nine facilities submitted data collection forms, two of which are public facilities, and the highlights are as follows. 90% of the nine facilities have responded or received health insurance for mental illness. However, what is unknown is whether the coverage is adequate for the treatment provided. Adolescent evidence suggests that the amount allocated for mental illness under the standard health insurance contract, which we know as SHIC, is inadequate and is used only for inpatient admission. Many of the mental health diagnoses are long-term illnesses requiring sustained and continuous treatment and care. Under the Health Insurance Regulations 2017 revision, the inpatient benefit for mental health is CI 25,000 per lifetime. There is a continuous upward trend of increase in the number of persons who seek treatment for mental illness. This is a positive step which may suggest that the stigma associated with a mental illness is decreasing. Persons are taking care of themselves as well as education and prevention programs and resources are more accessible. A large percentage of the clients seen is between 25 and 64 years, followed by 0 to 18 years age group. This confirms that many of our children and adolescents are also seeking care and treatment for mental illness. More females than males are also clients. The number of visits or encounters for outpatient services during the year of COVID-19 pandemic continues to increase over the same period for the previous year. For the Caribbean Haven Residential Center facility, more males and females use the inpatient facility, where the average length of stay for residents was 50 days, more than, 50, more than a 50% increase over the previous year. For the Health Services Authority, the average length of hospital stay was 11 days. Um, employ, the employee category of counselor therapist makes up a large number of the mental health employees employed by the facilities, followed by psychologists. Also included in offering treatments and care for mental health services are registered behavioral technicians, applied behavior analysts as well. These professions provide added value to the scope of care available to the islands. Now, the top three diagnoses were grouped under anxiety, depression, and others where, were included as attention deficit, deficit hyperactive disorder, autism, autism spectrum disorder, to name a few. 
Madam Speaker, the information will continue to be collected quarterly and the findings reported to the Cayman Islands House of Parliament annually. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to report that the Commission collaborated with various agencies during 2021 to share information, raise awareness and educate our community. The members met with the following agencies, the Alex Panton Foundation, Information Rights Coordination Unit, Loud Silent Voices, which is an NGO, Health Insurance Standing Committee, Royal Cayman Islands Police Service Liaison Officer with Mental Health, and Caribbean Haven. Along with these meetings, Madam Speaker, the Commission um, was also able to host two community meetings in early 2021, which was January and May, both of which were well attended. These meetings perhaps help perhaps helped to advance the work of the Commission and provide assistance for the unit at the HSA through a, a common understanding between stakeholders and the public. Madam Speaker, in the eight years since the Commission has been established, the commitment and dedication of its members to the improvement of mental health for all remains unchanged. Madam Speaker, as has been stated many times before, the Commission give of their time freely. And I so would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their time, their efforts, their passion for the work that they do. The Ministry of Health and Wellness remains committed to its support of the work of the Commission and on strengthening mental health services throughout our three islands. After all, our goal to strengthen public health nationally cannot be achieved without this key component. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The National Gallery of the Cayman Islands Annual Report and Accounts, 31st December 2021, to be laid on the table by the Honourable Minister of Health, Sports, Culture and Heritage. The Honourable Minister of Youth, Sports, Culture and Heritage. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the Annual Report and Accounts, 31st December 2021, for the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands. Does the Honorable Minister wish to speak? It's self-explanatory. Got two more. Does the Honourable Member wish to speak? No. No, it's, it's explained for yourself. So ordered. Annual Report 2021, Cayman Islands and National Museum, to be laid on the table by the Honourable Minister of Youth, Sports, Culture and Heritage. The Honourable Minister of Youth, Sports, Culture and Heritage. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the annual report 2021 for the National Museum. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak? No, thank you. So ordered. Cayman National Cultural Foundation, Creativity, Heritage, Education, annual report 2021 to be laid on the table by the Honourable Minister of Youth, Sports, Culture and Heritage. The Honourable Minister of Youth, Sports, Culture and Heritage. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the annual report for the National Culture, Cayman National Cultural Foundation 2021 annual report. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak? No, thank you. So ordered. Office of the Ombudsman, annual report 2021 to be laid on the table by the Chairman of the Select Committee to oversee the performance of the Office of the Ombudsman. The Honourable Minister of Youth, Sports, Culture and Heritage. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House 
the Office of the Ombudsman uh, Annual Report 2021. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak? Just to say that the committee is very pleased to see where the, um, but the new Ombudsman is trying her very best with a shortage of staff uh, to try to take this office to the level that it should be at and to say, can, to wish them the best of luck in their endeavours. Thank you. Freedom of Information 2021 Annual Statistics Report to be laid on the table by the Chairman of the Select Committee to oversee the performance of the Office of the Ombudsman. The Honourable Minister of Youth, Sports, Culture and Heritage. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the Freedom of Information 2021 Annual Statistics Report. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak? No, thank you. So ordered. Office of the Auditor General, Cayman Islands, follow up on past PAC recommendations 2022 to be laid on the table by the Chairman of the Standing Public Accounts Committee. Report of the Standing Public Accounts Committee and the report of the Office of the Auditor General. Follow up on past PAC recommendations 2022 report to be laid on the table by the Chairman of the Standing Public Accounts Committee. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table the report of the Office of the Auditor General, Cayman Islands, a follow-up report on the past PAC recommendations 22, 2022, report number two. And with your permission, ma'am, I'd also go, like to go ahead and ask your, to give leave to go ahead and pre also present and lay on the table the report of the Standing Public Accounts Committee on the report of the Office of the Auditor General follow up on past PAC recommendations 2022 report number two dated February 2022. Sorry. So the report and the PAC's, the, the CPA Public Accounts Committee's report on it. So, order, does the Honourable Leader of the Opposition wish to speak there too? No, thank you, ma'am. So, order. Questions by Honourable Ministers and members of the Cabinet. Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, um, just rising to move the suspension of um, standards <coughs> 11, 7, and 8 to allow the, sorry, 23, 7, and 8 to allow the um, asking of questions mm. after the hour of 11. So ordered. Question is that we move to questions after the hour of 11. All those in favor, please say aye. Let the signing orders be suspended. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The elected member for Georgetown North to ask the Honorable Minister of Planning, Agriculture, Housing and Infrastructure. Question number five. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I know that uh, the member is not physically present in, in his seat at this point in time. May I ask with your indulgence that we allow the next question to be asked and I seek to find him and, and make sure he, oh, he is present. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise 
to ask a question in my name <clears throat> to the Honorable Minister of Planning, Agriculture, Housing, and Infrastructure. And the question reads, can the Honorable Minister state whether the 24.55 acres of property purchase for affordable housing in Georgetown, Block 20E, Parcel 20E, Block 213, REM3, will be, will be used for the purpose intended, and if not, has replacement property of similar size been found? The Honorable Minister of Planning, Agriculture, Housing and Infrastructure. Madam Speaker, the 24-acre property purchase is located off of Halifax Road from Lynch Pearson Highway. Madam Speaker, as many may have um, heard, the government recognized that the land previously identified for housing in Georgetown is also a key part of the drainage and the ecosystem of the area. As such, Madam Speaker, the government and the NHDT will have to reevaluate the site to determine the best option Therefore, it is difficult to determine exactly how this site will be developed. However, I assure this Honorable House that we recognize the importance of the housing in the Georgetown area and will keep the House abreast of the development. In, additional, in addition, Madam Speaker, we are actively looking for additional property or lands that could be utilized to provide good value for money. Are there any supplementary questions? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I could ask the Minister to state whether or not the affordable or reasonable property is that being identified for the district or in the district of Georgetown and not outside of Georgetown. Madam Speaker, um, yes, we are looking at additional properties in the central part of Georgetown, and I've been talks with um, some of my colleagues about um, properties in certain locations. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, I heard him say Central Georgetown. Uh, was that just a term, or you were actually looking at, as we call it, Central Georgetown in the Central District? Madam Speaker, um, that was just a term of reference. I'm, I'm from the north, so I just, when I sit down, I mean, I look at the overall picture of Central. My apologies if he misunderstood me. Leader of the Opposition. Um, Madam Speaker, I just want the Minister could be a little bit more specific in terms of where in Georgetown, because of the, such a, I mean, I know a lot of time spent trying to identify property, there's just very little of it available anywhere. Madam Speaker, there's a lot of property for sale in Georgetown. I don't know if the members don't look around Georgetown for themselves to see what is in Suriba. I've tasked the team to start to look around. So obviously if there's no property that date that we should be looking into, maybe they could pass it on to me. The elected member for Georgetown South to ask the Honourable Minister of Education, question number six. The elected member for Georgetown South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, I rise to ask the Honourable Minister question number six on the order paper standing in my name. The question, can the Honourable Minister provide an update on the expected completion of the John Gray High School and advise whether it will be oper operational by January 2023? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, an uh, answer was circulated yesterday afternoon. I did have word with the Honourable Member from Georgetown South. The corrected answer is now in my hand and I would hope is in the possession of the House. I seek your leave to read the corrected answer and for the sake of clarity, at the time of circulation yesterday, the answer was correct. This morning, um, two of the fire doors that came are wrong because of that safety comes first, so it has caused us to reflect the correct answer as we have no intention at any material stage to mislead honorable members of the House to answer. John Gray High School Project A, representing a new school building, is expected to be operational by quarter one of 2023. Are there any supplementary questions? Just a supplementary question um, to the minister. Um, is there a time frame in terms of the arrival of the fire doors? Honorable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, although it is um, believe or I am re reliably informed that it should be by January, we thought out of the abundance of caution, we would say um, Q1, so we would not have to come back and make a further amendment if um, there's bad weather, the boat can't come, or it's because of Christmas, there are further delays. So there will be a press release that's going out. Um, I have a meeting tomorrow with Mark Alpine and my senior staff as to the way forward because it was originally envisioned that the entire school would be moving over. Um, teachers would return on the 3rd of January and the um, remnants of the school would go just for John Gray and remote learning and go into the school on the 20th. That is no longer necessary as a result of the two fire doors not coming for the corridor. Um, there is a section that will get the red card, so a number of classes will go over in that section on the 3rd of January, and the remnant would go over. Um, we were hoping January, but I did not want to tie the team down until I had a face-to-face -face meeting with Mac Alpine tomorrow to get all the logistical um, issues worked out. If the member wishes, I could communicate um, after the meeting to her a further update in writing. The elected member for Red Bay to ask the Honourable Minister of Health, Wellness and Home Affairs. Question number seven. The elected member for Red Bay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ms. Madam Speaker, I am to ask the Honourable Minister with responsibility for health and wellness and home affairs. Question number seven standing in my name. Can the Honourable Minister provide the Parliament with a list of the senior staff positions that have become vacant over the past 12 months at the Health Services Authority and provide the reasons for the resignations? Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Individual personal matters are not normally discussed in Parliament, as staff has some reasonable expectation of privacy as it relates to relations with their employer. Therefore, without getting into specific details about the individual uh, public officers, what I can state in more broadly terms, Madam Speaker, is that the Health Services Authority currently employs approximately 1,100 staff, and those employees have an average tenure of just under nine years. Now, during the past 12 months, three individuals at the senior management level resigned along with four individuals at the middle management level. Among the senior management resignations, one person resigned at the end of 2021 to pursue other opportunities in the private sector. 
Another retired at the end of November 2022 after over four decades with the authority. And the third resigned during the probation period, citing difficulties with the job responsibilities. At the middle management level, all four resignations were contracted non-Caymanian employees. One individual resigned to pursue an opportunity in the central government. Another resigned to return overseas, while a third resigned to take up an opportunity in the private sector. The fourth individual did not give a reason for their resignation. To put things into its appropriate context, according to statistics publics published by Nursing Solutions Incorporated, the average hospital turnover rate in the United States for 2021 was 25.9%. The HSA is currently tracking at less than 10% for 2022. The Honorable Member for Red Bay. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and my thanks to the Minister for the comprehensive response. Madam Speaker, the final paragraph of the answer speaks to an attrition rate of less than 10% for 2022. But what I am interested in knowing is what percentage of the senior management team and the middle management team have resigned during this period, not the overall staff complement. Honorable Minister for well Health and Wellness. Madam Speaker, um, I thank the supplementary question, but the actual statistics of middle management and senior management staff, um, those actual stats I'd be more than willing to get and provide to this Honorable House at a more appropriate time. But we should understand that uh, as a minister, even though the board is there to um, represent the minister and cabinet, there's just certain sort of um, operations and where employment is concerned that it would be flagged to the board and from their reports given to me, if there was a huge concern, of course, yes, that would be made, brought to my attention. I understand my colleague's uh, concern and I will be in a better position once I get the relevant information and provide to this honorable house at a later date. Are there any other supplementary questions? Statements by honorable ministers and members of the cabinet. I've given leave to the honorable minister of planning, agriculture, housing and infrastructure to make a statement. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, it is with a grateful heart that I stand again in this Honorable House to provide another update to the Caymanian people on projects taking place in the Department under the Ministry of Planning, Agriculture, Housing and Infrastructure. While I not intend to be an exhausted list, but please permit me, Madam Speaker, to list some of those areas in which we have made great progress. Number one, increasing investment in awareness of our technical and vocational training programs. 
Number two, increasing the number of parks and civic centers and multi-purpose halls within the communities. Creating a new and expand existing industries such as agriculture, a provision of affordable housing. Five, development and implement a national stormwater management plan. And enact, six, enact the legislation and regulations to ensure developments have the proper infrastructure in place. Madam Speaker, let me start with one of the outcomes that is very close to me, expanding the agriculture sector so well as improve the well-being of our people. We have found ourselves in a period of renewed interest in agriculture as consumers and producers both locally and globally become increasingly aware of. The challenges of the world food production due to factors such as climate change and ongoing war in Europe, the importance of food security and benefits and personal health, the economic and communities and countries consuming fresh, wholesome and local, locally produced food. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of the Department of Agriculture have been addressing the issues of local food security with a multi-pronged approach. We do not want to react to impacts, but be carefully planned to advance in the event of a range, especially of natural disasters and world events. In light of, the the light of this, Madam Speaker, my ministry has been working to finalize the draft Cayman Islands Food Nutrition Security Policy, which was commissioned as far back as 2015. The draft policy, which was prepared by the ministry <coughs> with the assistance of the Caribbean Agriculture Research and Development Institute, is a holistic approach in making Cayman Islands food and nutrition secure country. The government's goal through this framework are to increase the adequate supplies of affordable, safe, and nutritious food items to ensure the availability to meet national requirements at all times. Increase the access to Caymanians and visitors to sufficient, wholesome, affordable food, especially to the children and the elderly. Protect the public by providing quality and safety assurance of food supplies, whether locally produced or imported. Enhance nutrition interventions with the broader public health framework. Madam Speaker, the Ministry held close to 10 public consultation meetings across all three islands to inform the public about the draft policy to get their input on the plans. I just want to thank each member of parliament who attended the session to held in their constituencies. This shows your interest in the issues that not only affects you and your constituency, but your future generation in Cayman, in Caymanians. Our next step includes further ministerial reviews and submission of cabinet and policy approvals and then implementation. Madam Speaker, the ministry team is grateful to the multi-sector steering committee which include individuals from the private and public sector, as well as the academic, or who have given their time for, ex for the, um, their expertise to move this draft policy forward. Madam Speaker, we have a plan, and a plan that will be implemented under the watch of this administration. Since my last presentation in the House, Madam Speaker, the Ministry of the Department of Agriculture have been implementing a number of projects to ensure the adequate and accessibility to local food for years to come. Some of these initiatives include 
our national egg strategy. The ministry has launched the first food safety quality standards for layers and operations called the Cayman Islands Poultry Standards Layers Operation. Madam Speaker, our aim is to certify that all egg producers across our islands, with the help of, po of the poultry experts who have been recruited to guide our farmers, the plan is to improve local egg safety and quality assurance which will ultimately increase the consumer's confidence in the community or the commodity. Members of this Honorable House will be pleased to know that a pilot group has been established with 16 commercial farmers whose farms are currently producing over 60% of local table egg production. That is approximately 105,000 dozen eggs annually, Madam Speaker. The Department of Agriculture will provide those farmers and others who are interested with some equipment and inputs necessary to meet the standards and market requirements. Our livestock development plan Madam Speaker, you may recall that the government provided 350,000 in funding for the importation of approximately 100 heads of livestock, 150 cattle and 30 goats in, Dec in December of last year. Members of the House will be pleased to know that in January of 2023, the Cayman Islands Agriculture Society will land the final batch of cattle under that agreement. Madam Speaker, the Agriculture Society will also purchase on behalf of the government 35 purebred Jamaica Red Bull cattle that is suited for our local environment conditions. 35, sir. This elite herd will be used to establish the first ever cattle breeding program in the Cayman Islands. The plan, Madam Speaker, is to maintain the superior genetics of these animals, with 12 of them being kept for the breeding program and 23 of them sold to selected farmers based approved by the ministry. Madam Speaker, a line with our implementation of the cattle breeding program has been the training of Caymanians for a veterinarian service division in artificial insemination, embryo transplant technology and the practice. Two individuals have already been trained with five more to undergo training in the first quarter of 2023. With the continued training of our local people, Madam Speaker, we will have the expertise needed to increase the success rate of artificial semination on island. Madam Speaker, I previously shared in this house that I support the livestock development program and the cattle breeding program in the ministry um, that started to roll out a national livestock identification and tracking system early in May. This system tracks livestock including information on the identity, ownership, the geographic location, and all information collected is, is stored electronically under the control of the Department of Agriculture. Close to 300 livestock have been tagged to date with visual air tags have them affixed to each animal with the plans in place for an animal passport with the same identification number as that on the air tags to be issued to the owner. Madam Speaker, the National Livestock Identification and Livestock System will bring the Caymanlands in line with international standards in farm to consumer supply chain, that is traceability. Concerning the farmer's ID, 
and registration program. Madam Speaker, on assuming my post over a year and a half ago, one of my first steps was to conduct a review of the agriculture sector to a certain of the resources improvements needed for its modernization. Out of that review has come a new farmer's identification criteria developed by the representatives from the Ministry of Department of Agriculture and Agriculture Society. Madam Speaker, one of the significant changes to be made will be the move from the Farmer's Identification Card Program to the Farmer's Identification and Registration Program. The new Identification and Registration Program will improve how government provides benefits and incentives to the farming community. Identity and identify and register all agriculture producers to assist with creating policies. Collect, collect an agriculture production data, restruct the allocation of benefits and incentives to the farmers sector. It is important to note, Madam Speaker, that as part of the new program, there will be a shift in the name of farmer to agriculture producers. This is in keeping with the international trends in the sector. These are exciting development, well, Madam Speaker, that are aimed at modernizing our sector and bolstering our island food and nutrition security. Our farmers are energized by the improvements that are taking place in the sector and have been sharing their feedback and suggestions with the Ministry and the Department of Agriculture. I want them to know that the park government is listening to them and is working to provide technical resources and agriculture inputs to require to grow and strengthen that sector more. Madam Speaker, our policy team and legislative drafters are preparing the necessary documents to support the legal and regulatory framework for the development of the modernization of the agriculture industry. This includes the agriculture land lease policy. The Ministry with support of the Ministry of District Admin, Administration and Lands have completed the draft policy which aims to make large tracts of land available to farmers for the growing of agriculture, produce, and rearing of its livestock. We are currently awaiting the feedback from our internal stakeholders on the policy, and our next steps will be to make the document available to the public for consultation. In addition, Madam Speaker, both the Animals and Plant Protection Act are being revised. Instructions have also been given for the drafting of pesticide control and agriculture bill. The ministry target is to, uh, to have these bills before the parliament by the end of the financial year of 2022-2023. Madam Speaker, to quickly touch on the 2023 Cayman Islands Agriculture Show before I move on. The President of the Agriculture Society informed me that all is all the track for the eventual show for the, is all on track for the eventual show for next year. The event is scheduled for Wednesday, February the 22nd, 2023 at the Agriculture Grounds and will be held under the theme, Agriculture for the Future. We anticipate that it will attract some 10,000 attendees. I have extended invitations to my counterparts in Barbados, Jamaica, and other Caribbean 
to attend this event. The Agriculture Society and the Ministry will share more details on the upcoming event in this coming week. Turning to another area of major priority for me and this government, the provision of quality affordable housing solution for the Caymanians. Madam Speaker, our government also has a plan for affordable housing and is committed to providing support to the National Housing Development Trust to increase the number of houses across the districts. Since my last presentation made to the Honourable House in September, some progress has been made in the areas. Just last month, Representative of the Ministry of NHDT broke ground on the Phase 3 of the Lighthouse Gardens Affordable Housing Development in West Bay. The subdivision design for Phase 3 of the Lighthouse Garden Development consists of 19 affordable housing lots. This phase will complete the 9.5 acre property with a total of 55 affordable homes at that location. The member of West Bay West, Mr. McKeeba Bush, who attended the groundbreaking, has expressed his joy about the new housing lots and has already been in making inquiries about further expansion of, of joining lands. <laughs> Madam Speaker, some of the members of this house may be aware that NHDT has completed work on Easton and Bodentown housing development site. While there are some delays due to the availability of materials and service, the 10 houses, seven in Easton and three in Bodentown, are ready. NHDT is now in the process of assigning those houses to applicants who have been waiting for the opportunity. In addition, the ministry has gazetted the main road leading to the development, Lake Destiny Drive, and the National Roads Authority, I would say, has just completed or should have had a completed lot yesterday for its use uh, with the paving of that road. Madam Speaker, I want to commend the NHDT for all it has done to keep construction costs low, especially at the time when materials and other inputs for development projects are increasing. They have done so without compromising the quality of the homes, which will be equipped with wood cabinets, granite countertops, porcelain floors, and other amenities. Importantly, Madam Speaker, the NHD continues to offer these houses at a low cost, with the reported market value equivalent to those provided in the open market. Work is also progressing well at the 12-acre Northside housing development site where we broke ground for the 45 house lots last December. The subdivision plan was approved early this year and the, the trust is now concentrating on install and the installation of the water pipeline and road infrastructure. While the NHT board continues to concentrate its efforts in building on vacant land in the housing sites on the east and north side and east end and in West Bay. It had also been tasked to replicate those efforts in Georgetown by acquiring land for new development. Madam Speaker, aligned with our goals to make home ownership more accessible, I am pleased to report that NHD Board approved the interest rate adjustment to match the prime lending rate 
for 17 existing tenants in the, in the lease to own program. This interest rate adjustment will also be applied retroactively. This is a measure that will significantly assist the 17 tenants at East End, Windsor Park, and the West Bay Lighthouse Garden location. The changes mean that the tenant's existing commitment will be reset to a repayment position similar to a mortgage repayment arrangement with the local banks. In addition, their arrears will be adjusted accordingly. It is expected that the interest rate and the react, uh, retroactive adjustment will encourage these persons to take the bold step of paying off their loans own, owing and owning their own homes in some cases, addressing their, um, their rears that they were in. All of these tenants who will receive the benefits of the interest rate and react, uh, retroactive adjustment are over the age of 55 years. In keeping with the government's policy to strengthen the support of older persons, a decision was also taken to waive their closing fees, including the administrative fees and the valuation. Madam Speaker, we are doing this because we want to alleviate the burden on our senior citizens who have worked hard and made a contribution to this country. They deserve to live in dignity and not under the consent of worrying of high fees and high costs of living. Madam Speaker, I have made this call on a number of occasions, but I believe it is worth repeating. It is important that we move away from the association or associating of affordable housing, the usual negative bad word that we always have with people in um, pointing and saying that those are the poor people homes. Madam Speaker, that is so far from the truth. In countries like Singapore, for example, public housing are the preferred housing choice for the majority of population. Why should it be any different for the Cayman, Cayman Islands? These homes are affordable and they are perfect for young families, starter homes. They're also excellent homes for those families who have spent many years paying rent but could never qualify for a mortgage. Our PAC government will continue to focus its attention on providing these opportunities. During this term in office, I have instructed the Ministry of staff and the NHT board to proactive and review the entity's initiatives with a view to making the programs more beneficial to our people. Madam Speaker, we all know that home ownership is a cornerstone of a strong community. These housing initi initiatives will provide the opportunity for many to take their place on the first rung of the home ownership ladder. Madam Speaker, it will be remiss of me not to mention also that the NHDT has started to take a look into your Apple Blossom site, which is, I think, is in your area. I was going to ask the honourable member if he was reading from the wrong version of his speech, as I hadn't heard that as yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Madam Speaker, um, unfortunately nowadays I don't have to carry two speeches, but um, I would not forget the Apple Blossom site because there are several people in that area that call me weekly. Madam Speaker, that area is 
I've just received the the um, sketch drawing of how the layout of the land will be, and it will be moving forward shortly for cabinet to observe, and then on into planning for approval for the land parcels, so that we could actually start to look in to buy to build homes there. Um, Madam Speaker, just to let you know that site is a little bit more easier to deal with too because all of the most majority of the infrastructure has been done already. So it was just realigning the parcels to fit the infrastructure that we have there. So we didn't have to reduplicate anything and we could start to roll homes out in the short of um, term of next year going, which I am very excited about for those people in that area. Madam Speaker, moving next to facility management department. Madam Speaker, in an effort to improve the customer service provided by the government, the department will be rolling out in the new year the Cayman Islands Government Contact Center to improve the customer service experience by bridging and filtering the communication channels between the public and the internal customers and the government agencies. Several contact centers or um, center agents who have been deployed from Travel Cayman are currently being trained in different entities across the government. We are optimistic that these agents will be able to assist customers who have queries and provide fast resolution to their issues. The department also has completed a number of projects at the civic centers across Grand Cayman and continue with several upgrades which will make the buildings more accommodating for users, including those with special needs. The aim is to have all centers up to disability compliant. At the Constitution Hall, upgrades have commenced the installation of security cameras as well as work to make both bathrooms and stage and wheelchair compliant. A facelift include the replacement of the flooring, also repairs to the ceiling, the bathrooms, the replacement of lighting, and the creation of a small kitchenette. The South Sound Community Center. At the South Sound Community Center, also security cameras have been installed. Roof repairs are currently taking place, along with window replacement, flooring, bathroom upgrades, and a general facelift. The Gun Bay Civic Center, that facility has been equipped with new appliances, security cameras, chairs, tables, LED lighting upgrade, the entry door replacement, the basketball court has been resurfaced, and the new basketball hoops have been installed. The East End Civic Center, the flooring, the ceiling, the AC unit, the stage and the ducking have been completed and the installation of a security cameras, an EV car charging station and the painting and painting have also been completed. <laughs> Work continues on the bathroom renovation and the roof repairs are about to commence for the Eastern Civic Center. Yes, sir. So the DP was the The North Side Civic Center, the painting, the flooring, the ceiling, and the stage have been completed. The installation of a 
electric vehicle car charging station security cameras have also been completed and the fencing replacement is still in progress madam speaker for the upcoming year it is anticipated that all the civic centers will be equipped with video and audio equipment and interior upgrades automated security lighting and security alarms when all of these works are completed madam speaker these centers will provide a space where Caymanians of all ages can gather to enrich their bodies and minds as well as foster the feelings of a community and a civic of pride. I am pleased to report, Madam Speaker, that the Facility Management Department is working alongside the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Culture and Heritage to introduce some of our Caymanian history and heritage at the civic centers. This will include information and photos, visual art about Caymanian men and women who have contributed to the nation's building and development of our island. Madam Speaker, there is currently a committee in place working on this project that includes local artists and members of the various districts. The project is expecting to get off the ground early next year. And I've been informed that the plan will be rolled out at the Gun Bay, East End and North Side Civic Center. The department has also been a primary contributor of a national energy policy and recently installed a 100 kW carport mounted solar array at the government administration building which will be commissioned this week. In addition, they have installed several charging stations at the civic centers and the government administration buildings and the Cayman Islands Environmental Center with plans to install more. Moving next to another department that provides internal service to government is the Department of Vehicle and Equipment Services. Madam Speaker, just three weeks ago, the department officially opened phase two of the redevelopment project for the Department of Vehicle and Equipment Services. This project, which started under the previous administration, has been a major priority of this government, as well our aim was to ensure we provide a safe, modern and comfortable environment for our hard working employees while enhancing our customers' experience. With the completion of phase two of DVS, customers will now be able to benefit from the state of an art 19th service bay facility, which provides the required configuration to service the vast range of vehicles and equipment owned by government. As member, members may be aware, as a result of the phase one re redevelopment, the team has been able to integrate employees, stores and management fleet services in the two-store administration building. The total floor space of the entire department is over 42,000 square feet. Madam Speaker, we are very pleased that this new garage facility will lead 
to more improvements in DBS services, including a better turnabout, turnaround, repair times, and increasing the work stability for larger vehicles. I must pause to commend the management and staff of DVS for having the national energy policy as an important part of the strategic goals for the 22-2023, as they have made it a priority to expand and integrate government's electric fleet fleet. The director, Stephen Quinlan, has shared with me that the new facility ushers in the new era of the Department of Vehicles and Equipment Services, an era which will require a total change of mindset at DVS in order to embrace the advancement of new technology. This is not only the expectations of the government, but also that of the public to whom we serve. I am particularly proud to see the director's commitment to the Caymanian mechanics. DVS also remains committed its current mechanics with the continuation of their electric vehicle service and safety training. Madam Speaker, we are thankful to the Honorable Premier Wien Pandan, the Deputy Premier Chris Saunders, and my colleagues in Cabinet and many others who have been supportive of this project. As it relates to the Department of Vehicles and Driver's License, Madam Speaker, the Department has progressed well with this change agenda to make, to make it more convenient for Caymanians and residents to access the service they need. Some of the members in the House will be aware that DVDL opened its West Bay office at the Jake Scott's Marketplace in October. Madam Speaker, we have been receiving very positive feedbacks from our customers as the new location offers more comfortable space for them to conduct business. Some of you will recall the old DVDL West Bay office in Banks Plaza, right across from the police station. That office served this purpose, but was a very small space, just 600 square feet, which could no longer provide the seating capacity and the world-class level of service we want for our customer experience. Madam Speaker, this new location of 1,200 square feet will not only offer more office space for our customers, but will provide better accommodations for our staff and a place for more equipment, such as the driver's license machines and the, um, the ticketing system. In addition, we now have the capacity to increase the number of employees there to include a supervisor, three licensed officers, and a customer service officer. I am particularly pleased with the space as it is friendly to our elderly and those with disability, which is very important to this government. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the DVDL staff, led by Mr. David Dixon, as well as the Public Works Department, for all their work in making this a reality. I also owe a debt of gratitude, Madam Speaker, as well as the Members of Parliament, Minister Andre Ebanks, for your support as we worked to complete this project, the new location will serve us very well for years to come. 
and, we'll, and the place will, where we can proudly serve our Caymanian people and reside. Madam Speaker, I must say that um, that I must say that I think that that that, that um, new site for DVDL is is in a great um, location, and my colleagues from the west, and I think you yourself or may have a um, someone from your staff may have attended the opening that day and was all very happy with what they saw. I was very pleased that, that, that the expansion was happening in West Bay. Over the past year and a half, Madam Speaker, we have seen positive levels of transformation that has been taking place at the department. Since the start of this year, of the 14,241 customers that attended the West Bay office, 97% of those customers stated they were very happy with the customer service provided. We are very pleased with the customer feedback, Madam Speaker. We are also encouraged by the public response to the online option that are available to them to renew vehicles and driver's license. For example, in 2017, 48 persons used the online system, generating 6,000 in revenue. Over 6,000 people used the system, with it generated $1 million in online revenue in 2019. And 17,000 people, with a $3.55 million in online revenue this year in 2022. We are still not where we want to be in terms of online usage. So I want to encourage the members of the public to utilize this option. But what we can say is by the numbers showing, people are getting more used to going online and, and, and I'll make it a lot more easier for them by just taking care of their, their driver needs, license and license of vehicles right there from their, off of their phone or right on their phone or, or their laptop. Madam Speaker, I will now draw your attention to the upgrades of the Department of Planning. Honorable um, Minister, just wondering if you could give us an indication if you have um, quite a bit more left to go with your statement. Um, the reason why I'm asking is because the copy that I have received is different than what you're reading from, so I can't really follow. My apologies on that, Mom. If, um, I can give you a copy of this after if you want to take a quick break. A, or, not a quick or, break. Or, or We're just wondering if we want to finish your statement? And um, I have about maybe 35 to 40 minutes, I would say. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Yes, Madam Speaker. Um, may the Opposition have a copy of that speech, the statement as well? We don't have anything to follow. Or I will, yes, I will ask for all members to receive the updated copy. Madam Speaker, is this a convenient time for us to take a break then? A lunch break? Yes, um, we've now reached the hour of 12.30. The House will suspend for lunch and we will return in an hour at 1.30.